Well, hi kids, thanks for joining us for the third session of the Veritas series, the new Veritas series. We've been talking about the resurrection and we're gonna look at a little bit of some of the evidence here for the resurrection of Jesus pretty soon. Before we go on with the evidence, I want us to look just for a few minutes at the fascinating way God's chosen to weave the picture of the resurrection into his creation. I'm not sure you'd call this evidence, it's just interesting, it's fascinating because he's done a lot of things in his creation that kind of point us to the resurrection. Sometimes we don't think about this, but it's important to God that we realize how important the resurrection is to him. For example, he created us to need sleep. And for most normal folks, <laughs> and some of you teenagers right now be thinking, well, I guess that lets me out. <laughs> I guess it lets me out too, actually. But, but for most normal folks, every night, we lie down on our beds and we go to sleep. Picture's death. And in the morning, we wake up and get up. Picture of resurrection. So God's created our bodies to give us this daily picture of death and resurrection every day. And when you get older, like me, and maybe need some naps during the daytime, sometimes several times a day, we get a little picture of death and resurrection. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool the way God's wired our bodies that way he also created the earth we live on to spin on its axis once every 24 hours so that every evening we see the sun go down and everything gets dark picture of death and then in the morning sun comes up picture of resurrection happens every day Beautiful picture of his creation of death and resurrection every single day. He also tilted the earth on its axis so that every year winter comes. Winter pictures death. And then what? Spring. Everybody looks forward to spring, don't they? Spring, a wonderful time of the year. Pictures resurrection. <laughs> beautiful. God created plants so that we could take a little ugly dead looking seed poke it down in the ground picture of death and burial and later up comes a beautiful flower it's a picture of resurrection it's amazing god also created an amazing little creature that all of you've seen all of you're familiar with this he made sure it could be found just about everywhere in the world where there are people you find these little things we call them caterpillars. Starts out as a lowly caterpillar, looks like a little worm crawling around. And then it reaches a point in its life where it dies. It weaves its own little casket around itself, a cocoon. Pictures death and burial. But you know what's gonna happen next, don't you? Yeah, beautiful butterfly emerges, comes back to life. Beautiful, gorgeous butterfly that can fly. It's an amazing picture of death and burial and resurrection. God's woven that into his creation. He built it into our solar system even. He put a couple of planets closer to the sun than we are, Venus and Mercury. And he put our moon in orbit around the earth so that the moon, as well as Venus and Mercury, go through what we call phases from our place here on the earth. So when you think about the moon, for example, there's a point at which our moon is, is what we call full, full moon. It's big and bright and round. And then over a period of the next couple of weeks, it wanes. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner on what appears to be one side of the sun. And then it finally just disappears entirely. That could be a picture of aging and death. But soon, what do we see? Well, on the other side of the sun, a little crescent of the new moon coming back to life, seems to us, and gradually gets stronger and stronger in this new life until it's full again. So it's a monthly picture of death and resurrection that God's woven into his creation. In addition to all these pictures he's woven into his creation, he gave Christians a command to practice baptism, the picture of death and resurrection. So when we baptize people, we place people under the water, pictures death and burial, and we lift them back up out of the water again, Pictures resurrection. Before we start looking at the evidence God's left us to make sure we can show others 
that the resurrection really happened. Let me share one more tactic that some unbelieving college teachers will sometimes use to try to shock and amaze Christian students. It may not be teachers. It could just be other college students that are skeptics and unbelievers. But I've heard of skeptic college teachers doing something along this line. They will say to the students in the classroom, hey, I want you guys to guess who I'm talking about. I want to describe somebody. You tell me who I'm talking about. He was born of a virgin on December 25th. He was born in a cave. There were shepherds at his birth. He died. Three days later, he rose again. Well, you know what the students are going to say. They're going to say, well, you're talking about Jesus, of course. And the professor then will look kind of smug and say, no, sorry, you're wrong. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about another God. His name was Mithras. And he was worshipped by the Romans hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And he proceeds to lead students to believe. Of course, they've never heard of Mithras, right? So he, can, he, he, he leads students to believe that most of these students who've never heard of Mithras, that Christians must have just borrowed that stuff from this other religion called Mithraism. <laughs> they don't know. They've never been taught about this stuff. They, this is all new to them. And they conclude, many of them do, well, Christianity must be a bunch of myths that were borrowed from another pagan religion that had a bunch of myths. Of course, what the secularists will not tell the students often, and sometimes the secularists don't know it themselves, is that while it's true, some of this is true, a little bit of it's true, that Mithras, the myths about Mithras, say that he did not experience a normal childbirth. <laughs> They say that actually he came forth out of solid rock, which is a little bit hard to equate with a virgin birth. I mean, isn't it? <laughs> and yes, they did say he was born on December 25th. But you're probably aware that the Bible doesn't say anything about Jesus being born on December 25th. <laughs> you know, the Roman Catholic Church borrowed the date from pagans in the fourth century. They were, the pagans were already celebrating, like, like the people who worship Mithras, they were already celebrating the winter solstice. And so in the fourth century AD, uh, the Roman Catholic Church said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll adapt that. We'll call it the day that Jesus was born. The Bible doesn't do that. Now, I'm glad we did it. I'm glad the church decided to celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th. I think it's a good thing. I like to celebrate Christmas. But there's nothing biblical about that date. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't tie Christianity to Mithraism at all. What about the part about being born in a cave? You know, sometimes Christians teach that Jesus was born in a stable, which was actually a cave where they kept the animals. Well, the Mithras myth said that when he came out of the rock, there was a hole left behind in the rock, which is supposed to be kind of a cave, I guess. That didn't sound anything like the birth of Jesus. And yes, the Mithras cult says there were some kind of shepherds, I'll put that in quotes, around when Mithras came out of that rock. But they were kind of weird because they were beings according to that myth that existed long before human beings were ever created. So again, it's kind of hard to relate that to the birth of Jesus. Anyway, this is significant. The stories about Mithras is true. Mithras was being worshiped hundreds of years before Jesus was born, but the stories about Mithras, a lot of these stories about his birth, for example, didn't appear until a couple of hundred years after the birth of Jesus. So if there are any similarities, which there are very few, it's likely that Mithraism may have borrowed it from Christians instead of the other way around. And listen, the early Mithras traditions don't say anything at all about his death, much less his resurrection. This is important. The first we hear about Mithras' resurrection from the dead was from an early Christian leader. His name was Tertullian. Tertullian said that the worshipers of Mithras were at his time celebrating the resurrection of Mithras. But since Tertullian was born about 150 years after Jesus was born, and the early church leaders concluded that the Mithras worshipers were borrowing this idea from Christianity. It wasn't the other way around. So the claim that Christians got their stories from pagan cults is what we might call today fake news. There's a whole lot more stuff like this, but it's pretty easy to find on the internet evidence that it's just just done to mislead people. It's not really true. But many unbelievers have convinced themselves that the resurrection of Jesus is just a myth. And many times it's just because they don't want to believe it. 
So they claim to believe that Jesus rises from the dead is just a myth. And it's kind of like believing other stories. You know, you may have seen stories in movies about mythical persons like the flash. You remember the flash running around the streets of New York, like at the speed of light or Spider-Man climbing around on the buildings of our cities or Superman flying around rescuing people. But we know these characters are pure fiction. They're just made up characters. And skeptics have convinced themselves sometimes, some of them have, that the resurrection of Jesus is the same thing. It's just a made up story. So if a Christian comes along and says, I believe Jesus literally rose from the dead, an unbeliever who believes the resurrection is a myth is going to say, how can you possibly say that? How can you believe that? You seem to be an intelligent person. How could you possibly think it's true? It has to be a myth. Dead men don't rise from the grave. And you know what many, many Christians say at that point? Don't get me wrong. Now, I know I'm repeating kind of what I said earlier. There's nothing wrong with this answer. We just got to remember it's not enough for most skeptics. If you ask most Christians how we know that Jesus is alive, how do we know he really rose from the dead? You know what most Christians say? They'll say things like this. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Some of you recognize those words. They're part of a wonderful old Christian hymn that we used to sing all the time in our churches. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And we can sing those words very loudly and very enthusiastically with all our feelings and all our being and all enthusiasm. And it's true. I mean, I sing it. I love that song. And we mean it. And we know he lives within our hearts. But many, many young adults, especially if they start going by their feelings only, even those who claim they used to be Christians or you know, go to church or everything, they'll say, you know what? I don't feel it. <laughs> I'm not sure I feel anything that would tell me he's living in my heart. And to an unbeliever, from an unbeliever's perspective, it's just subjective talk. He looks at us and says, yeah, 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 okay, okay. You know what? There are people out there that claim to be Napoleon. <laughs> I don't take them very seriously. Why should I take you any more seriously than I take that guy? Also, there are Mormons out there, for example. And they, they're really mixed up about who Jesus is. They've got it all wrong. And they tell me, they know Mormonism is true because when they read the Book of Mormon, they get this burning in the bosom that told them it had to be true. So why should people take our word any more than they take the word of a Mormon? What do we say? Well, what we say is God's left us some powerful evidence. And this evidence, guys, can serve two purposes. Listen, this is really true. The Holy Spirit can use the evidence to help people see the truth of the gospel and help them come to repentance and help them come to faith. He uses the evidence to bring them to himself. There are many testimonies, you can find them on YouTube, of atheists that God has done that very thing with, and he's done it many, many times. Some of you might wonder, when we talk about this evidence, you might be thinking, well, Steve, do you think that, that you can use evidence to just argue people into the kingdom of God? No, no, you can't do that. And many people will look at all the evidence that we offer that God provides. And they'll say, no, I'm not buying it. No, I don't, they don't want to hear it. They'll just, they just made up their mind. They're not going to believe no matter what. But God certainly has taken away their excuses. But the truth is God can use many different things to draw people into his kingdom. He might use a gospel tract that you shared. He may use the way you love people and your friendship with people to draw someone into the kingdom of God. He might use a gospel message that was preached in a revival or in a regular church service or in a BBS service. He can use those things. And many times he uses this kind of evidence to cause people to consider the gospel, draw them into the kingdom of God. Of course, we can't argue people into salvation. But listen, listen, try to get this in perspective. You really can't love people into the kingdom of God either. You can't teach people into the kingdom of God. You can't preach kingdom into, people into the kingdom of God. God has to draw them, all of them, no matter what methods we may be trying to use. But he chooses to use a lot of different vehicles, a lot of different methods, including evidences that he's seen fit to leave with us. This helps a lot of people. But there's another important reason why we need to understand this evidence. Many of our young people, maybe you, I hope not, but if you do, it needs to change. Many of our young people have a kind of faith that's very easily attacked. 
Many of them are just not ready to deal with the kind of hostile questioning they're going to face in a highly secularized culture like the one we live in. And knowing these kinds of things can not only help them to stand firm themselves, if they know these things, they know they have answers to those questions. It can also make you available to the Lord to help other people who may be weak Christians to stand firm also. So we're going to start looking at those evidences big time next time. Okay. We've taken way too much time in this video. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much. For the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. Thank you so much for being a God of truth. Thank you for giving us your word, which is the word of truth. Thank you that Jesus has told us very clearly that he is the truth. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. Thank you, Father, that you define truth and truth is what corresponds to the reality that you've created. Well, please don't let us get sucked into the foolish thinking of so many people who think that they can define truth for themselves. And Lord, please don't let us get sucked into the foolish thinking that makes people think that life is all about them. Help us realize, Lord, it's all about you. Help us to bring you the most glory possible. So thank you for giving us the truth in your word. Thank you for giving us our Lord Jesus. Thank you that he died on the cross for us, that he rose again from the dead. And thank you for giving us evidence that we can share with others. And as time goes on in this series, help us to learn this evidence well enough that you can use us to help others take you more seriously and maybe find Jesus for themselves as you work in their hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, please use us for your glory. We offer ourselves to you afresh right now. In Jesus' name, amen.